All right, and again, <clears throat> please stop me with a hand wave or anything if you have any questions. Please, please, please. Okay. So first of all, I really want to encourage those of you who can, um, this coming Thursday, Shasta College is ho hosting via Zoom, one of America's most experienced journalists. She's been in the business for 20 years, Mara Liason. She was gonna come last semester and speak in person, but the COVID. So we set up a time this Thursday. So extra, extra credit if you can join our Zoom panel and show off to Mara how smart and wonderful our Shasta College students are. Yes, go ahead. Oh, never mind. I just heard from the boss. The student panel filled up. Well, talk to me if you really want to get in. I'll, I'll make room. I'll make room. You know the F word, flexibility. Okay. So this is extra, extra credit right here. Um, let me go to the Pueblo Revolt. All right. Here's one of my favorite. So let me know, uh, technically, can you see me, hear me, and see my screen? The thing with the big map on it. Okay. <clears throat> Again, I am recording it. Let me make sure I'm recording it. Yay, all right. Triple check everything, redundancy. <clears throat> this is a wonderful telling map of a snapshot of the US Census at in the year 2000, so this is already 20 years, ago, years old. Um, but it shows you the diversity, the ethnic diversity of the United States. And each color demarcates the majority, quote unquote, ethnicity or where people are from in each county in the United States. So for example, Shasta County is over here, and there were more people to claim German heritage than any other heritage. Um, you're not screen sharing. I'm not screen sharing. No. Thank you. Screen sharing. Now can you see the big mappy map? Okay. So you heard all the words I had to say. Let me go back. So the different colors are the different um, places where people say I came from there. And nobody came around with a DNA swab and did Ancestry 123 or whatever it's called. Um, so this green swath in the middle, in the northern middle part of the United States, um, says that most people said they came from German ancestry. How many of you have German ancestry of one kind or another? Yeah. What that tells me is a lot of Germans want to get the heck out of Prussia, out of Germany, right? I'm out of here. Sia von Wehinger. Wehinger was the name of my people who came. The purple, dark purple down here, are those who claim African-American heritage, right, on the census. Interestingly, you see this yellow color right here in the south, right, amongst the purple? Those are where the Americans live. So they're the ones claiming American heritage. You should laugh, that was a historian's joke. Monique, slight smile from Monique. Okay, you've heard that joke before. So it's interesting that those who identify as American over, say, German American or English American or Dutch American live in what used to be the Confederate South. We delve into much more of that in my US history class. So this is just a plug for my US history class. <clears throat> the area we're gonna be talking about today is current day New Mexico right, Eastern New Mexico specifically. And this light pink right in here, let me move the big X, sorry. The light pink right in there are those who um, claim a Hispanic um, ancestry. And when I say Hispanic, where's that from? If people claim they're Hispanic, where do they say they came from? Go for it, your turn now. Latin America. Good guess, I threw that, that was a curveball on purposely. Hispanic actually um, means you came from Spain, Hispanic. Latino or Latina is 
the word that many people use to claim they're some sort of Latino or Latinx um, background. But don't worry, these names are fuzzy and people use those names interchangeably. But in this case, they mean they came from Spain. <clears throat> and yellow means uh, American Indian. That's this big reservation complex in here, much of Eastern Oklahoma and much of the Dakotas and Montana. So I'm gonna take the next 20 minutes or so and share with you what happened in the 1600s in this part of the world. So you better, better understand, geez, there still are people who claim a Hispanic heritage here and people who still claim a Native American heritage here. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Can I, can I move on? You're good? Okay. <clears throat> so as you're reading, as Monique's reading in the Spanish Frontier chapter by Alan Taylor, um, one, of the, one of the wedges in the Spanish colonial project was the mission system. So by the 1620, um, hundreds of Franciscan priests, right, made their way up to this area here, where you see all these di uh, different names, and it's probably kind of fuzzy for you. <clears throat> no need to go and memorize these things. You can probably Google map it and really dive down if you want to. But the reason why they're all together in this patch of color is what is because the Spanish people came to call these people Pueblo people and the name stuck. None of them called themselves Pueblo people. <clears throat> and the only reason why the Spanish called them Pueblo people is because they lived in things that looked like towns to the Spanish. Let me just show you, fast forward and show you an image of, for example, one of their towns. So when the Spanish rolled up on the Pueblo, they said, hey, that looks like a town. And town means Pueblo in Spanish. Okay. <clears throat> However, the people living here were very linguistically diverse. There were over 200 different ethno-linguistic groups. So we're talking about a very diverse group of people that the Spanish were just going to call Pueblo because they lived in towns. <clears throat> The native groups who lived around the Pueblo, right, on the boundaries or on the edges of the Pueblo communities, for example, up in here, right, here's the Apache name, Apache. Um, we call the Ute, the Navajo, and the Apaches. And Ute, Navajo, and Apache folks were more semi-nomadic. They didn't live in sedentary towns like the Pueblo peoples did. And one of the ways the Ute, Navajo, and Apaches um, survived was to raid these kind of wealthier Pueblo villages, especially during the harvest season. So one of the things the Spaniards promised the Pueblo people living in here is, hey, if we can come in and build a mission and build a garrison, and if you allow us to come in, we will protect you from these outside raiders. And initially, many Pueblo people said, ah, okay. We'll work with that. A lot of folks didn't, but enough did um, let them come in. <clears throat> However, also part of the Spanish deal of coming up and colonizing today's Southwest is the sacred kivas of the Southwestern peoples. This was like their version of church, right? And it's um, the fancy word for where humans celebrate things that are underground like the people from Crete celebrated um, octopus and things that were in caves, like underwater and underground. The fasty, fancy word for that is thonic. So if any of y'all ever play Scrabble, oh my gosh, show off using that word there, C-H-T-H-O-N-I-C. It just means folks who worship things down, down under. Unlike Christians, where's the Christian sacred place? Right, where did churches aspire to, literally? All right, your turn to answer, my lovely students. For Christians, where's that sacred happy place? Heaven. Heaven, and it's up there, Heaven. right? You gotta reach for the stars up there, up there. So it's, it's quite different, right? That's why Gothic cathedrals are seen, who can build the tallest Gothic cathedral in, in Europe? There was a, a race to reach the highest they could go architecturally. So <clears throat> the Spanish came in, built um, a couple dozen, I'm sorry, about 50 churches here and there, missions, I'm sorry, missions. Missions had churches within them. 
And another part of the deal the natives had to do in order to um, earn or get the protection of the church was they were to have a civilization, uh, they were supposed to civilize themselves according to the Spanish. And what do I mean by this? Uh, the natives were supposed to civilize themselves. And I have all these random words here. Go ahead, Lee. Christianize. Yeah, and how did that play out in your everyday life? Like if I had to pick out things you do every day and change them, what are some examples of how native peoples had to do things the way Christian Spaniards did? Can I pick on you, Mo Monique or Yadira or Rachel? Go ahead. Oh, can't hear you. All right, let me just let me just go right to the one that's the most salacious. What's the uh, for these Franciscan Christians? What's the only proper way to have sex? Being married. Missionary style. This is where you get the word missionary style, because the all the other ways are how the animals do it. Okay, so it was a sin to have sex, number one, with somebody who you're not married with, a one-on-one -on -one marriage, not a polygamous marriage, not with my five wives, and in the missionary style. So this got a lot of natives in a lot of trouble when they didn't uh, have sex the proper way. They had to speak in the proper way, so they had to learn Spanish. Uh, they tried their best to teach in Spanish. Um, <clears throat> they had to walk in a proper way. Right, you know how in etiquette school sometimes proper women are taught how to walk, right? You just kind of sway back and forth and you walk, right? You don't want to walk like a, right, flailing everything about. A proper way to dress, and of course that's the Spanish way. A proper way to eat. What's a proper way to eat? What might you think they're going to teach them? Monique, can I pick on you? I assume that they would teach them how to eat with forks, knives, and spoons, that sort of thing. Yeah, three times a day, not when you're freaking hungry, no snacking, right? Three times a day, fork and knife. You know how when you go to fancy restaurants, there's like seven spoons and three knives and all that? It drives me crazy. I always feel for the dishwasher. I'm like, poor dishwasher. Anyway, so the proper way to eat, and they had to convert to Christianity. Thank you, thank you. Um, Pueblo peoples accepted some of these Christian practices, and Franciscan friars enforced some of them. It was mostly obedezco pero no cumplo, and that what that means in Spanish is, okay, I, I, I obey and I will be a Christian, but I'm not, I'm not going to comply with all your big, long set of rules. Okay. <clears throat> For example, one of the things the Pueblo peoples did not comply to that the Spanish um, wanted them to, was this binary male and female gender identity, okay? You know how um, most modern Christian societies, there's men and there's women, right? Adam and Eve, and that's it, right? The Pueblo peoples, as did many, so these diverse group of Pueblo peoples, even the Sioux on the plains, the Navajo, the Zuni, they had multiple ide uh, gender identities that was normal in their culture. For example, one Pueblo group, the Zuni had five, right? If you were a man-man, you're the guy who went out and uh, made war on folks and um, kind of governed and made treaties with other folks. If you were a female-female, you would have kids, take home in the garden. And then if you were female with a little bit of men, you had other gender roles. If you were male with a little bit of female, you had other gender roles, or there's a, a photo taken of this two-spirit person right here, who was uh, said to have equal male and female gender roles. So this is one of the things that many Pueblo people said, no, we're keeping that Spaniards. Oof, and what do you think happened to many of the Pueblo folks who um, kept their gender, gender roles despite the Spaniards coming in? What do you think happened to them, Rachel, Lee, Yadira, or Monique? What do you think happened? I imagine they were probably, I imagine they were probably attacked or, I don't know, violent responses. Yeah, they were attacked in very violent, yucky ways, I won't say because we have a three-year-old right there. 
And um, if you want to look more into this, there's a powerful book about, it's called When Jesus Came, the Corn Mothers Went Away, Marriage, Sexuality, and Power in New Mexico. So I'm just citing my source. And I even keep my old graduate school notes for the, for the book. So keep the notes you all take in class. If you're a nerd like me, you will consult them later. Oh, hang in there, Rachel. Be strong. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, there's a picture, there's an image you can show your son, Rachel. However, while a few Franciscan priests did enforce rather stringent um, civilizing process laws, most Spanish colonists didn't care. They didn't care if the Hopi continued their snake dance, right? They said, most Spaniards are like, hey, as long as they don't rebel and as long as they work for us, they can continue doing all their native practices. I don't care. And I'm just telling you, this is a reason just to show you this powerful, isn't that a powerful photo? And again, remember I told you they're thonic. They, excuse me, they worship things under the ground, one of them being a snake. So if you're a Christian friar and you roll up on this ceremony, what might you think? Monique Lear Yadira, what do you think the Christian friar is going to think rolling up on this ceremony? They might be inclined to think, given their own beliefs, that they were worshiping the devil or something. Oh man, yeah, this is like Satan stuff all the way, playing Ozzy Osbourne backwards and worshiping the snake. This is, right, this is Satan's village. However, again, most Spanish colonists did not really care as long as they worked, <clears throat> but some did. Oh, by the way, out of the, I think this is in the chapter you're reading, Monique uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. 60% um, of all the Spanish friars who went up there were killed by the, hope, by the uh, Pueblo. Because they're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, mm-mm, get it. So I think that's in the book. It's a very high number were killed. <clears throat> Another change that came about when the Spanish uh, colonized and settled what's today the southwestern part of the U.S., is one of the main ways the Spaniards made money, and you're going to read about this with Juan de Oñate, is they would kidnap and, and enslave Utes and Apaches. What was worth almost as much as gold was human bodies. So um, enslaving natives was um, a common and horrendous thing because in New Spain, about 400 miles south of New Mexico, were the Potosi mines of central Mexico. They were very, very well, um, a lot of silver ore in those mines, and they 100% depended on enslaved Indians and enslaved Africans to bring the wealth of the mines out. And even though the Spanish court way over in Spain outlawed this practice of enslavement, People here, um, many colonists here in the Americas ignore the laws. Once again, obedezco pero no cumplo. I obey, but I don't comply. It could be a theme of Latin American colonial history. <clears throat> Mexico's silver production was the biggest in the world, right? Largely because of this mine at Potosi and largely because of enslaved natives down in the mines pulling out the silver. So back to the Pueblos. And please stop me anytime I get sick of myself talking. So please, Monique, stop. Even if you have to just make up a question like, how are the tomatoes doing, Chris? Um, <clears throat> so the Pueblo peoples were really stuck between the Spanish, the labor that the Spanish colonists forced them to do, the conversion and lifestyle changes the priest forced them to do. And they're also stuck between the continued raiding of their lifelong, their longtime enemies, the Utes and the Apaches. Utes, what does that word sound like? Utes? What state kind of sounds like that? Utah. Utah, yep. So Utah is named after the native, the language the native people spoke, so the Utes. So because of this, um, in the Pueblo population dropped from about 40 to about 17,000 during this time of missionary activity, right? Uh, it dropped because of um, enslavement, famine, because the Spanish were overworking them, and because of disease. 
But interestingly, disease played a smaller role in the population drop in the 1600s than it did in the 1500s, say, uh, when we spoke about the Mexica last time. So if you were a Pueblo person experiencing all these hardships, what would you do? What would you do, Yadira? You got to take care of the family, or man, it's just hard times. Um. I don't know. I pro I probably would have been one of those people that killed the Spanish or tried to. To try to flee. You would leave. Yeah, definitely. Or I just wouldn't, I wouldn't conform. All right. She would rebel or lock and load or leave. What would you do, Monique? I would definitely try to fight. And if that didn't work, leaving would be um, another option that I would definitely choose. Yeah, right. And that's what humans have done throughout history. Either try to, you know, fight if that's not going to work, flee for safety so your three-year-old wonderful son doesn't fall under harm, right? Lee, what would you do? Get my family out of there. Yeah, leave. Refugee. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And Rachel, I'll let you, you got enough on your plate. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> and that's what some did. And where did many Pueblo flee to? Well, they fled to the Utes or the Apaches. Many of them said, all right, screw the Spanish. I'm gonna go join the Utes and Apaches who are fighting against the Spanish. And do you think the Utes and the Apaches um, accepted the Pueblo people? You can just nod your head yes or no. What do you think? They did actually, because they were, their, number, their population was also hurting because they were getting raided by the Spanish for slaves. So many Utes and Apaches said, hey, come on. Right, come on, Lee and your family, welcome. Right, let's go raid and kick up some Spanish butt. And Lee's like, all right. <clears throat> um, and because many Pueblo people were starting to rebel, there was whispers of rebellion, they weren't working as hard, right? So they were, they were kind of just working a lot slower for the Spanish. It's called weapons of the weak. What do you do when you're in a weakened position? Well you just are a bad worker or you break the yoke or break the machines or something else. So in 1675, the New Mexican governor, Trevino, remember he's selected, he's not elected. Trevino tried to crack down on certain Pueblo rabble rousers. So there were these Pueblo um, priests slash leaders. There's no separation of church and state. Most of the priests in the Pueblo areas were also um, uh, people of state, right? They ran government. So they arrested 47 Pueblo men for witchcraft, publicly whipped and imprisoned them, and then hung four of them in the public square to try to get the message across to the Pueblo. Furthermore, the New Mexico government destroyed the remaining kivas. Remember I told you that the Spanish friars didn't 100% demand conformity from the Pueblos. They were, there was a kind of a little bit of tolerance, but not in 1675, there was destruction of masks that were being made for ritualistic purposes. And there was an increasing punishment of Pueblos continued um, sexual acts that weren't um, okay by the Spanish. Remember, there was still um, folks who were doing non-gender binary sex, right? For the Spanish, it looked like, oh my gosh, women are having sex with women and men with men in ways that aren't right, aren't right according to our worldview. So they took a lot of time writing about, and um, the Spanish friars did, and complaining and punishing a lot of the sex acts. It just seems like something that especially annoyed the Spanish Franciscans. So what ended up happening? <clears throat> there was the right guy at the right time. This guy, this Afro Pueblo man, Pope, okay, so let me say that again. His father was an African who had come up with the Spanish, right, and his mother was a Pueblo woman, right, they had a baby, and he grew up with the Pueblo people, okay, Pope did. He did not grow up in a Spanish settlement. He's getting, he's a very charismatic uh, individual, he actually gets all these 200, not all of them, but many of the different 200 ethno-linguistic Pueblo groups to unite. It was something they 
had not done to unite against the common enemy of the Spanish. So in 1680, across many um, villages, right, the, they had really good communication, even though they didn't have the Twitter or the whatever thummy pressy thing you guys use. Um, many, many villages around the Pueblo area just exploded in rebellion. It was the largest and most successful um, rebellion in North American history against colonizers. <clears throat> And what do you think they attacked? Who do you, what elements of Spanish society do you think these Pueblo rebels attacked? Churches. Say it again, Lee? Churches. Churches, yeah. Yeah, Dita, what do you think? What did these native, these Pueblo rebels attack of the Spanish? Priests. Churches, priests. priests. Yeah, the priests got the heck out of there. What do you think, Monique? <clears throat> Um, probably the military bases or maybe even food supplies that the Spanish had. Yeah, all of the above. You're correct and thank you because I just needed to see your wonderful faces and stop talking for a second. Um, look at what they targeted. They destroyed churches, as Lee said. They destroyed most of the livestock. The pigs. They didn't like the pigs because the pigs eat everything down to the nubs. They eat all the corn. They did like the sheep though. They kept the sheep because they could keep them corralled and they used the wool. And as to this day, Navajo people are very famous wool textile makers. I'll show you an image at the end. Even though they were told to destroy all the um, Spanish food, there's a couple funny, I don't know, funny is the right word, a couple letters in which some Pueblo people said, hey, can we, we keep the watermelons? We really like those watermelons. And they said, okay, keep the watermelons. But there's other elements of Spanish society. They, they destroyed forks, right? They destroyed wheat and barley because they much preferred, what was their source of starch and um, carbohydrates instead of wheat and barley? Oh, corn, I think I heard, I read your lips. Corn, yeah, corn is much more, a lot more um, uh, bang for the buck to use a, military terminology. <clears throat> All Christian marriages overseen by a priest were dissolved amongst the Pueblo peoples. All former traditions are now enforced. And while many Pueblo people kind of were getting used to and accepted certain Christian rituals, if they insisted on it, um, native Pueblo, um, Pueblo folks would come down on them, right? So they enforced um, the dissolution of Christian marriages and <clears throat> the remarrying in the Pueblo way. Polygamy was now embraced once again. So if you were a wealthyish guy and you could afford a couple wives, you were welcome to marry a couple wives, as was the Pueblo tradition. And the Pueblo lived 12 years without the Spanish, right? They continued, um, they continued their practices. And yeah, the Spanish had gone and left to Albuquerque and down into southern Mexico. <clears throat> you know one super interesting result of the Spanish leaving? Well, what do you think? Give me, what do you think one of the outcomes of the Spanish being gone for 12 years was? Wild guesses are welcome. What do you think, Rachel, Monique, or Yadira, or Lee? I feel like the the natives adopted some of the Spanish ways, regardless of like them being so against their ways. Like, oh, I, don't, yeah. I think the Spanish left, but some of their traditions or whatever stayed back. Oh, watermelons, yum, watermelons. And you know the biggest one? The horse. So the horse of horse, of course. After 1680, that was when horses started to spread across North America. Before 1680, the Spanish kept a, kept a tight lid on horse trading and horse stealing because the Spanish knew like, dang, if those Utes or those Apaches get a hold of a horse, they're going to learn to be horsemen or caballeros and kick our butt. So they kept a tight lid on um, the buying and selling of horses. I think, I forget which 
Plains Indian in North America said this, but they said, we can almost forgive you white man for taking all our land for you have given us the horse. And sure enough, uh, the spread, the return of the horse, the horse actually first evolved in North America millions of years ago. And it was much smaller. It was the size of maybe my medium sized dog. But when the horse migrated over the Bering Strait into Siberia and the big grasslands of what today is Eurasia, they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, evolved bigger. And it was the Europeans who brought the horse back. So only after 1680 did the horse really start to spread into North America. And as you know, native cultures embrace the horse. I could go on, I kind of into the whole horse thing. There were some native cultures on the plains who didn't even ride the horse for like 300 years or 200 years. They would just like walk the horse, right? And they would eat the horse. They would use the horse for, for food, right? So many different cultures used them in different ways. Questions about the horse. Isn't that interesting? Horses. <clears throat> Um, yeah, Dita was also right. The Pueblo adopted uh, and kept um, sheep and they raised the sheep and created these woolen textiles. And today, if I don't know if that show is on Antiques Roadshow, I don't know, that used to be on back when I used to be a TV person. Um, but Navajo rugs are worth quite a lot. And here's a Hopi young woman standing in, uh, sitting in front of a Navajo rug. However, um, Pope died, and it just wasn't him, his death that dissolved the alliance among them. Um, there were internal fights that started to swell up. Apache Ute Navajo started to raid once again. And by 1692, some Pueblo peoples were even asking the Spanish to return. So the Spanish did just that. But this is the biggest point. This is my big point of the whole lecture. And this is why I think the Pueblo Revolt lecture is important. The Spanish returned, but were far more tolerant, right? They kind of looked away if the Pueblo were practicing even their non-gender binary, you know, social norms, even if they were practicing in their kivas or practicing the black snake dance, okay? Um, as long as the Pueblo folks didn't rebel against Spanish authorities, and as long as the Pueblo folks kind of pretended to go to church once in a while. I just want to give you an uh, opportunity to comment on that photo. Isn't that a powerful photo of the Zuni ceremony? It's very, I like it. So this is why you have the opportunity to just look at the slides. If you want to look at the slides. So um, I call this the Southwest Compromise. Um, the Pueblo traditional ways combined with Spanish ones. And here's an example. I know the uh, picture is kind of washed out, but here is a Christian church. And right in front of it is a Pueblo native ceremony being celebrated. So still to this day, Right, there are folks who identify as Spanish living next to people who identify as Native American. And by no means it is all kumbaya, one happy family, but right, um, it's, I don't think it's, it's an accident that the largest, one of the largest swaths of land that still has Native American reservations is this area in the Southwest. Questions or comments about the lecture? What struck you about it? Let me pick on Monique. It's Monique, I also saw you have office mates just like I do who come into your office, huh? So Monique, what struck you about this lecture? Um, I found it interesting that after um, all of that work to kick the Spanish out, they actually ended up some of them ended up wanting the Spanish to come back. I thought that was very interesting. Although I can understand why, because with, when that alliance broke up, there was no longer one uniting force. So they wanted someone to come in. 
and help them. Again. There was no longer a united enemy to rally against, like the Spanish, since they were no longer there. Yeah, exactly. And the story is way more complicated than I'm sharing with you right now. But I just kind of want to get you excited about reading chapter four from Alan Taylor, right? This is just one part of that chapter in which he talks about the Pueblo Revolt. Um, cool. Rachel, it seems a lot more calm in your office. Your office mate went elsewhere. Yes, he did. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, the, uh, the way that the Pueblo really weren't tolerant with the Spanish not being tolerant um, and kind of them moving out and the different practices that the Pueblo had. I found that interesting. Do you, are you speaking specifically to the different gender practices? Um, the gender practices, but also um, just kind of the fact that they weren't cool with the Spanish wanting to come in and regulate how they had sex and all that other stuff, too. That was just, and the snake thing ceremony was cool. Yeah. yeah. I know. It's just an excuse to show that image. It really is. Yeah, it is. There it is. There he is. Oh, that's not snake eye. Where's snake eye? There he is. And again, these um, photos are from the 1910s, just showing you evidence that even in the early 1900s, folks are Hopi are still practicing this right on their reservation. Cool. Um, yeah, Dita, what struck you about this chat? I, um, I really think it's, I don't know, it's kind of weird to think that horses weren't native to this land. That was something that I learned last year while I was helping my brother with one of his history classes. Like, I had no idea that horses came over here with the Spaniards. Yeah, horses, pigs, cattle, the kind of domesticated cattle, sheep, right? Part of this Colombian exchange, all these things came over. The chicken, right? There were ducks here, but not the chicken. And there was the guajolote, the um, turkey. Those were native to here. Yeah, but there's the horse spread. And again, the horse started here a million years ago or so, but only came back around the world when the Spaniards brought him. I'm also surprised that they didn't, um, I don't know, I guess the cows aren't, well, don't seem to be such a big deal in history. I would think the other way, because I feel like it's more, I don't know, common That's to eat a cow than it is again. to eat a horse. Ask me what you said again while I get a, a image up. So you're saying cows don't seem like a big part of history? Yeah, I feel like we hear a lot about horses and I just think it's more common to eat cows nowadays than it is a horse. So it's kind of weird to me that you hear mainly about horses. You're right. Actually, horse meat was a common part of American's diet until, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but like the late 18, early 1900s, horse meat was a regular thing you'd get at the store or eat. Right? It's a big, yeah, normal food. Um, all right, here's some, here's some cattle history for you. Share screen, Chris, figure out, share screen, multitask. <clears throat> so when, the, when cattle were first introduced to Mexico, this is an example of Mexico, the cattle population exploded because they didn't have any natural enemies. There was all this corn and pasturage all around. Natives were not allowed to hunt them. Edward Abbey calls them slow elk. So it's easy to hunt a cow, isn't it? You don't have to like stalk them or anything. Slow elk, you can just go right up to them. Anyway, uh, the cattle population leveled out by the 1580s because there just wasn't enough um, food for them anymore. Another item that really ravaged the Mexican landscape were the pigs. As you know, pigs go feral after a couple generations. Like where you all live, probably in, um, in uh, Fall River Valley, uh, Fall River Mills, is that what you call it? I bet there's feral pigs out there. I've never seen a wild pig. Yeah, you, it, you notice mostly when they root about, they kind of mess up the ground around. They are, they're pretty aggressive and they can get huge too. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. They can get huge too. Oh, they're big. They're aggressive. They will treat you. Right. I got to respect the pig. And then after the, you know how the cows eat so much and then the sheep will come and eat all the way down to nothing. 
right? You know the result in central Mexico about the invasion of all these European, um, it turned previous lush landscape into desert land. So the combination of um, cow, sheep, and pigs on the Mexican landscape changed it forever. And you can still Google Earth North Central Mexico, uh, for example, the Mesqui Mesquital Valley. But you know, Mexicans ever resilient. What do you think they planted here that could withstand this like des uh, desertified conditions? All right, put on your uh, Mexican stereotype thing. Cactus. Cactus, and because cactus makes tequila. Yep, they grew maggate cactus on these decimated lands. Previously, these lands were a lot more wealthy and I have, if you wanna look more into this, I have the book that talks all about this somewhere, but I'll share it with you if you want. Isn't that interesting? See, I get all excited. You, um, you asked me a question, I did, and I get all excited. So there, there's a little bit of cattle history for you. So Rachel, what struck you, or did I already ask you? Oh, yeah, I already asked you. Lee, what struck you? Um, yeah, I, I, I already knew that uh, horses weren't obviously uh, native to America, but I think what surprised me the most was learning about how this specific event was uh, what led to them uh, spreading across uh, like the Great Plains, because uh, probably the only um, native culture I've read a great deal about is the Comanches, who are probably some of the best horsemen in history. Oh, and yeah. it's pretty incredible to know that this particular thing happening in a in a pretty different region is what led it to them uh, getting like pretty much the cornerstone of their culture, essentially. Did you read that book about the Comanche, The Empire of the Sun? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah the Comanche Empire, that's what I read, and it, it, that was a, a really inc incredible read. Great book. Let me write it down for you all. It's called Empire of the Sun, is that right? Uh, the one I read was called The Comanche Empire, but we might be talking about the same book. Okay, I'll have to, yep. I have it here somewhere. Uh, okay, all right, well, um, Hey, I want to respect your time. I really do. But if you all have more questions about, because I'm here, right? This is like my office hours. I get paid to do this. So don't feel like you're putting me out. Okay. You all don't have to do this, but if you want me to go over anything, or if you want to just make sure you're understanding when things are due or when I find stuff, right? Let's do it. That's the one I read.